So my name is Melissa Addington, and I am a certified child life specialist working with operating room services at Roanoke Memorial Hospital. So I am going to speak to you all about supporting pediatric patients and their families. So my objectives for this presentation is to help you be able to identify common stressors for children in the healthcare setting, to be able to utilize developmentally appropriate ways of communicating with pediatric patients and their families, and to develop some techniques to help provide preparation and support to your pediatric patients. So just so you know who this information is coming from, um, I am a child life specialist. Here is a formal definition of what child life is. Um, you can see a certified child life specialist is a trained professional who helps reduce the stress and anxiety that infants, children, and adolescents experience in the healthcare setting by promoting effective coping. And the way that we do that is through play preparation, education, and self-expression activities. So um, if I were to describe my job specifically with operating room services in three words, I would say the big three, preparation, education, and distraction. And I'm gonna talk about that a lot today. Um, my job is to help kiddos understand what's going on what their role is, and then try to make it easier for them and for their families while they're here. I wanted to start with this quote. Um, it was written in 1972, and the paper was titled, you can see at the bottom, The Psychological Impact of Illness and Hospitalization Upon the Child, Infancy to 12 Years, and it's by Mary Roberts Robinson. Um, since this time, there have been significant changes in pediatric health care. Um, one very important change has been the emphasis on family-centered care. This has affected the way that health care is delivered to children and the psychosocial outcomes of children being in a hospital setting. But I just want to read this with you all. So those of us who have spent many years working in hospitals have come to take much for granted. We know kind, benevolent, capable, people interested in healing, the alleviation of suffering, and the prolongation of life. However, a child coming into the hospital for the first time may see us quite differently. No matter how well we do our job, we are not his parents, the hospital bed is not his own, and the world we provide is an unfair and frightening one. It's a world in which children are hurt, every body orifice may be entered, and when these are exhausted, we create new openings by injection, by IV, cut down, or by surgery. The reason I wanted to start with this quote is just to try and get in the mindset of a child coming to the hospital. We know that we are in healthcare because we want to help people, but that's not always the way that children look at us. So just keep this in mind while you're working with pediatric patients. So why are we concerned about our peds patients? First of all, kids aren't little adults. This means they are different emotionally and cognitively. They think about things differently and they react to things in a different manner than adults do. Um, this is also important to remember when we're working with our teenage population. Oftentimes they look more like adults than children, which leads people to sometimes treat them as adults when cognitively they still have maturing to do. Also, a lot of our kiddos um, could have stranger anxiety. It's, it's more difficult for them to meet so many people. And when you think about how many people patients meet just coming in for outpatient surgery, this says patients meet an average of 54 people in the first 24 hours of admission. At least at our facility, when patients come in for outpatient surgery, they're going to start by meeting the valet person. They go to a desk and meet someone who gives them a folder and a name band. They go to another desk and meet someone where they turn in their folder. They meet the person who comes and gets them and takes them from the waiting room to the pre-op. They meet the pre-op nurse, myself, the operating room nurse. They meet the um, surgeon, the anesthesiologist. Um, when they go back to the operating room, they meet a bunch more people. When they go to the PACU, they meet more people. They're constantly meeting people and it can be really overwhelming. So we wanna make sure that their needs are taken care of and they're not too overwhelmed. And the hospital, it's just not a normal place. It affects development. So we're gonna talk more about that. Now, um, these are five categories of children's fears. I want to point out that this is not five categories in relation to the hospital. It's just five fears, all of which could happen while they're at the hospital. So we see number one is a fear of physical harm or bodily, including pain, mutilation, or death. 
Number two, separation or absence of a trusted adult caregiver. Later, we will go over common stressors for infants, children, and adolescents. And I'd like to point out that the only stressor that spans from infancy to adolescence is separation from a caregiver. So pediatric patients want their parents near them while they're in the hospital. They, they will cope better if they know that their parents are able to stay with them. Um, the next you can see the unknown or the possibility of surprise. This is why preparation is so important. We want kids to know what to expect while they're here so that things um, do not take them by surprise. We, this is a fear. We want to um, help that by preparing them. The next one you can see is not behaving in the accepted, expected or acceptable manner. It can help kids feel more comfortable by letting them know what their role is while they're here. We'll also go over this more later. And lastly, um, if they have a fear of loss of control. The hospital is a place where kids do not have many choices, but we can help them feel more comfortable and more in control when we give them choices. And we'll talk more about that as well. Okay, so now we're going to move into factors that influence a child's ability to cope well. As child life specialists, these are some things that we take into account when we assess our patients. Um, you can see here we look at the child's age as well as their development. This is um, not always the same, so it's important to look at both. Um, we also look at personality and temperament. If you have a child who's typically anxious, they're also going to be anxious when they're in the hospital. If you have a child who goes with the flow, they might also go with the flow while they're in the hospital. Are they familiar with the hospital? Is this their first visit or have they been here before? What happened the last time they were here? If it is a first visit, it is especially important that their visit goes well so that if and when they have to come back, they won't be afraid to do so. And then you see um, involvement or separation from a caregiver. I've already mentioned, this is a stressor for kids of all ages. This is why we try to make it possible for a parent to be present during induction. But sometimes you see under that level of parental anxiety factors in. Sometimes parents are more anxious than kids, which can lead the child to become more anxious. and They might, may, might not be a best fit to go back to the operating room. And then of course, invasiveness of procedure that they're having or the severity of their illness. These all contribute to how well they're going to cope while they're in the hospital. Here are some typical responses to hospitalization. I think it's good to know these things. Um, the responses fall under three categories, and the first you see is passive responses. So examples of this can be that kids may seem disinterested, they may seem withdrawn, they may sleep excessively, be very quiet, which can lead to them being overlooked at, by staff because they assume that they're not nervous or scared. Um, so we always want to prepare our kids, even if they're super quiet. And I had um, one experience, I mean, I've had multiple, but one experience that sticks out in mind is when I was working with a kid who, when I went into the bay, he was asleep or his eyes were closed. And um, the nurse said he'd been asleep the whole time he'd been in pre-op. I stayed in the room and was talking to his mom when the doctor came in. When the doctor came in, he started talking to mom and explaining consent and talking to her about what to expect. Now the child who was appeared to be asleep opened his eyes real quick, looked at the doctor, then closed his eyes and turned his head to make sure he still looked like he was asleep. So this child was asleep the whole time. And the way they were coping with the stress of this environment was to pretend they were asleep and not have to talk to anybody. So it's still important to explain what's going on, even if you think your child, the child is asleep. Okay, another response, typical response is active or overt responses. For us, this is the easiest to spot. So um, this is because the, these kids are often really aggressive or inconsolable. You can hear them screaming or you can hear them crying before you see them. Um, so it's easy to tell that they're upset and they need some help. Um, and then regressive behaviors, this is the hardest response for us to spot and maybe something that doesn't manifest itself until kids leave the hospital. They can revert back to bedwetting or coping methods like sucking their thumb, needing a pacifier, they can become clingy, you know, they have attachment issues from having to be away from their parents and they just need more attention from their caregiver. So an important part of my job is to work with patients and their families to reduce and distract from the anxiety 
and fear that can be associated with surgery. And in order to do this, it's just more effective and helpful to know and understand ways that development impacts how children experience hospitalization. So what fears are associated with what age groups and ways that we can help ease those anxieties. So we're going to go into the next section and talk more about that, but try to think of your own childhood. What worried you or your children? What would worry them about being in a hospital? And hopefully this will help you understand where your patient is at and help you to meet their needs. Okay, so we're going to start with our infants. So the most vulnerable age for psychological stress of hospitalization is seven months to four years. That starts in this age group. So here are some stressors for infants you can see on the left side. So first you see separation from parents. We know from studying attachment that it can begin in babies as early as six to seven months. It typically starts around eight months and peaks in babies between 10 to 18 months. In our hospital, we have a parental presence policy for parents going back for induction, but it starts with kids who are one. So there is a gap in there who, for, um, who is typically allowed to go back for induction with their child and when kids form attachment. You can help with this by, you can help these kiddos and their separation anxieties by maximizing the contact these babies have with their parents. A lot of time, parents are unsure how, to, how in they're allowed to be. You know, can they hold their baby? Do they change their diaper or do you change their diaper? Can they touch their baby if they have an IV, et cetera? Um, just help parents know how involved they can be. Another stressor for this age group is irregular routine. They're in a new place and their caregiver is not listening to the normal cues they give them for things like when they want to eat. So this can be stressful for babies and make it harder to console them. Um, this quite possibly could be the worst day of their life up to this point. Um, you also see stranger anxiety as a stressor. We can help this by minimizing the number of caregivers when possible, um, which can be hard because everyone loves to see cute babies. I see that here, Every, there's a cute baby and all the nurses wanna come and see, um, but this can put more stress on the baby. We also learn from Piaget that infants learn about the world around them by using their senses. You can see that in the bottom corner. Um, so you can help prepare them by giving them a mask to play with or chew on while they're in pre -op. Most of these babies are super hungry, so they enjoy that little um, something. This helps make the mask more familiar to them and less scary when it's time to use it. Um, and if you have to even model how to use it on a stuffed animal. Of course, this is for our older infants, not our young infants. Um, so what are other ways you can help? More caregiver involvement. You can ask them what helps to comfort their child. Is there an item that they would like to take back with them? Is there a song that they sing to them to help soothe them? Another way to help could be involving the parent and using a comfort hold to help their baby and minimizing unnecessary stimulation. For example, <coughs> excuse me, we had an infant who cried when separating from his mother, um, but when it was time to go back, the anesthesia invited mom to come back. So she sat on a chair and held her baby. When it was time for a baby to have the mask held over his mouth, he became very fussy as most babies do. Um, but we had asked mom about a favorite song or a lullaby that helps calm our child. And mom and myself and a nurse sang the song to him as he fell asleep and he did not cry at all. It was amazing. It was a great induction. Um, but with mom's insight, we were able to make it a good experience for the baby, a good experience for mom and a good experience for us as well. It's not always going to be like that, and moms aren't always able to go back with these younger kids, but it's wonderful when it works out that way. So next we're going to talk about toddlers. As I mentioned earlier, seven months to four years is the most vulnerable age to psychological stress when hospitalized, so this age group is also very important. You can see some of the stressors listed here. Once again, you see separation from parents as a stressor. Um, restriction, loud noises, sudden movement, stranger anxiety, and unfamiliar environment are all things that are gonna be stressors for toddlers. So how can we help? Uh, well, we learned from Piaget that this age group is working on their independence. Anyone who knows a toddler can attest that one of their favorite words is usually no. So in order to help them feel more independent, give them simple, accurate choices and make sure that you do not give them a choice if there's not a choice to be made. Um, for example, a good opportunity to give them a choice could be, you know, I have, a, I have to put this sticker on your finger, which finger would you like me to put it on? Or I'm going to put this on your arm, it will give you a hug, which arm would you like me to put it on? 
One choice I hear offered frequently is when they go back to the operating room and their bed is placed next to the operating room bed and someone will ask, would you like to come to this bed? When the question is asked that way, I can't tell you how many times I've heard kids say no and shake their heads. Um, instead of asking if they want to come to the bed, you can tell them, I need you to move over to this bed now. Would you like me to give you a warm blanket when you get over here? So they have something they get to choose, but it's not something that is, you know, they have to choose the one thing. So going along with this independence, you can see that restriction. It can be a huge stressor for this age group to be forced to lay down. That is giving up their sense of control. So when these kids go back for induction, they're going to cope a million times better if they're allowed to sit up and breathe through their mask than if they're forced to lay down. It, oftentimes, if kids are forced to lay down at that point, then they just start crying and that is they're going to cry until they're asleep. But if you allow them to sit up, they feel more in control and oftentimes they cope really well with induction. Um, if you remember from our list of children's fear, we know that not behaving in the expected manner can be a fear for kids. So to help with this, you can let them know what their role is while they're here. We want to talk about this too a little in a little. Your job is to, for example, your job is to put on this gown. Your job is going to be to take deep breaths. Your job right now is to hold still. Uh, you know, those are some examples. So this is going to help them know that they're doing the right thing when they need to do it. Okay, so our preschoolers. This is a very fun age group. However, at this age, oftentimes, kids have a hard time distinguishing between fantasy and reality. So at this age, kids really view their body as one large container of fluid and bones. We had a child recently who came to get his tonsils out that was very scared. And after talking with him, you know, he disclosed that he thought that during surgery, they were gonna slice his throat to get his tonsils out. I, I would also be very concerned and worried if that was the case. Um, but, uh, and then I also worked with a child this age who was here to have a lumbar puncture and the child asked if the doctors were going to split her open. So it's important for us to talk to our pediatric patients because oftentimes they have this idea of what's going to happen that just isn't what's going to happen and, and knowing what to expect is going to help them to cope better. Then you can see in the bottom, they're in this phase called initiative versus guilt. So what that's going to mean is that you can often hear kids when they come to the hospital um, say things like, oh, you know, like, I, I won't push my sister anymore. Like, let's go home or I won't. I'll do what you need me to do. Like, let's just go home. And what they're doing is they feel like that they are being punished for something. And that is why they're at the hospital. Um, so it's important if you hear something like that, you know, you can let the child know that they're here because of, you know, they need whatever they need to be done. That's going to help them. And it's not because they did something wrong. You also see, let's see, um, egocentric as a stressor for them. So at this age, they're often very egocentric in their thinking and believe that everything they see will be used on them. So imagine going into an operating room and seeing everything in that room and wondering what is going to happen to you. This is one of the reasons that it's an important part of experience is distraction for our pediatric patients. Um, in our facility, we have an iPad that has games downloaded on it for different age groups and the iPad is one of the many tools that can help create alternative focus. It can establish normalcy and promote a sense of comfort, but it's not given to a child in pre-op to entertain them. It's actually held until it's time to go to the operating room. When the circulating is there to um, take the patient back, they're able to use this as a way to focus on the tablet instead of, you know, who they may see down the hall, going down the hallway, other, other adult patients coming out of surgery or, or different things that may be scary, and then going into the operating room and all the different things there. If, it, if they're given a tablet right before that, it's new, it's fresh, and they're really focused on that and able to be distracted many times. Sometimes they're just upset and that's not gonna help, but m majority of the time, a tablet is an awesome tool. So I would, en I would encourage you to use that. Um, but, you know, if they're focusing on anything, it could be a game, a joke, a book, a light spinner, they're just then they're not paying as much attention to what's going on in the room and they're able to think about other things and not just sitting there in silence thinking about what's going to happen. So what are some ways that you can help this age group? Um, keep parents with the child as much as possible. Keep the parents with the child. The, this age group is capable of a more detailed preparation. So use concrete examples, use visual aids, actually show them the anesthesia mask. This is gonna, you know, let them hold it, let them smell it and see what it's like before it's time to actually use it. So 
um, show them the leaves, you know, show them that they're sticky. These are stickers. They're going to be put on your chest. Um, you know, even the pole socks, show it to them before you put it on them. This is going to help them be more compliant, understand better, feel more comfortable. So next we have our school age, age group. Now we know from PJ that school age kids are beginning to understand things more logically, but they still have a difficult uh, time understanding hypothetical situations. So you can see here some of their stressors. Of course, they have separation from parents. You also see a fear of pain or needles. Now this age group is in the age that begins to get IVs before surgery. So 10 and under use a mask for induction and beginning around 11, these kids are starting to get IVs. So this can be a stressor. Um, you also can see a fear of death. The, um, that wasn't there in the previous age groups. And that's because this age group really starts to understand death more. So it begin, begins to be something that they worry about. Um, another fear that you see is induction. So this age group fears falling asleep. Um, I just think it's so interesting to know these different things, stressors for age groups because it proves true all the time. So sometimes in my preparation of this age group, they, the kid will be doing absolutely fine with everything, but can get very hung up on the fact that they will be asleep. They do not want to fall asleep. That when they're asleep, they're not gonna have any control. Um, when they're asleep, they don't know what's going on with their body. Um, but I, I like to just point out, if you notice that this is a stressor for the child, I will tell them all the steps and just stop mentioning the you'll fall asleep part. So, you know, I'm gonna prepare them to go back to the operating room, prepare them for the anesthesia mask and what their job is, that it's gonna be stinky air that they're breathing in, and then just skip over the part that they'll be asleep. And then the next step being that they'll go to another room after they breathe through their mask where they'll be able to have snacks, just skip over the sleeping part altogether. But I also wanna point out a correlation between the stressors of death and induction. So a lot of times the way that kids learn about death is through a pet dying. So if they had a pet who was put to sleep and then never came back, this can make them very worried that they are also going to be put to sleep and not come back. So they're associating being put to sleep with death. Um, because of this, I always emphasize that when the surgery is over, they will wake up. And when they wake up, they'll be able to have a snack and they'll be back with their family. Um, so how can we help this age group? Let's see, describe what you're doing before you do it. Um, encourage the child to participate in their care and ask questions. Offer choices when possible. Give them a task to do. Let them know their role. Teach them a coping strategy such as counting or taking deep breaths. And then just give them positive reinforcement for um, their cooperation. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about um, now, this age group can be misleading to us because they start to look more like adults. Their voices may change. They may sound more like adults. Sometimes this makes our brains assume that they are capable of understanding things as adults do, but adolescents are still developing. And so we need to continue to explain things to them a little differently than we would just for adults. Um, you can see from their stressors that they continue to have separation from family as a stressor, but this age group also is stressed about being separated from their peers. So friends begin to be very important to them and they can be stressed out about hospital stay will affect their peer group status. Will they look differently when they leave the hospital? Will they have to rely on others to help them with everyday tasks? Um, also, you see invasion of privacy as a stressor. So this age group is going through body changes. They're already uncomfortable with how things are changing and they want privacy. So you can help by making sure to knock before entering their room or say something to make sure they're changed before going into it, like opening the curtain to go see them. Um, step out when they're changing into their gown. If you are putting leads on them, especially if they're female, just make sure not to expose them while you're putting leads on. Just be courteous. Do what you would want someone to do for you. Um, you can also see that they have a fear of death, but that their fear switches from a uh, fear of induction and falling asleep to having a fear that they're going to wake up during anesthesia. So for this age group, I like to emphasize the role of the anesthesiologist, that they will be with them the whole time and that their job is to help them fall asleep and then keep them safe and comfortable until it's time to wake them up again. 
many of them have seen shows or heard stories of people waking up during anesthesia. So if that's a stressor for them, just encourage them to talk to their anesthesiologist about this fear when they come to talk to them and they'll be able to reassure them and tell them the things that they do to make sure they're safe. Um, other ways you can help them feel more comfortable would be to give them a say in decisions like, um, is there, have you had an IV before? If so, is there a spot that works better? Um, include them in their care. Also encourage them to ask questions. Um, you know, it's harder for this age group because they're starting to feel more like adults, but the consents and everything are still signed by their parents. So when you come in, make sure to not only parents because you have to, but also address them. Educate them on what to expect while they're in pre op while they're in the OR, while they're in the PACU. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit more about why preparation is important. Okay, so studies have shown that children who are prepared for medical procedures experience less fear and less anxiety, and they have better long-term adjustment to medical challenges. So this is why we prepare our patients. Um, it reduces fear, reduces anxiety. To promote long-term coping and adjustment, um, for future healthcare challenges, um, children who have, I mean, they're just going to do so much better if they're, if they're prepared. So if kids have a ne negative medical experience, they will have more stress and anxiety, possibly disturbances in their eating and sleeping and anxiety about being separated from their families. They're going to have uh, long term. This can lead to increased fear, post-traumatic stress and decreased cooperation. On the other hand, if kids are prepared, they will gain trust in medical personnel for being truthful with them. They will do better when they come back to the hospital. And this is why we want them to be prepared. When we do a good job of preparing them, we not only make this visit easier for them and for their family, we make all future visits easier and less stressful for their family. If there's their first visit is a traumatic visit, I cannot tell you the effect that that has on children. I've seen so many kids, it is hard for parents to even get them out of the car once they know they're at the hospital. So it is so important to prepare patients and to make sure that they understand what to expect. Okay, so now that we know that we should prepare, let's talk about how to prepare our pediatric patients. So when you prepare a patient, you want to explain what will happen um, in a, a developmentally appropriate way. So I focus on what to expect from the time that they get to pre-op to when they fall asleep and then when they wake up to when they leave the hospital or go back to their room. Let them know the sequence of events and sensory information and if they uh, may look different or how they may feel when they wake up. So for example, okay, so you're in the pre-op room. This is the getting ready area. Here you will change into a gown. You will also stand on a scale so we can see how tall you are and how much you weigh. We will measure your temperature. The thermometer goes across your forehead and might tickle. We have a sticker that goes on one of your fingers. It listens to your body and tells us how well you're breathing. We will measure your blood pressure with a cuff that goes on your arm and gives you a hug. Also in this room, you'll meet your doctors, your surgeon, your anesthesiologist. An anesthesiologist is a sleepy medicine doctor. They stay with you the whole time in the next room. They get you medicine to help you fall asleep, and then they make sure you are asleep and comfortable until it's time to wake you up. The way you fall asleep is by breathing through a mask that looks like this. It's squishy, it goes over your nose and mouth. Your big job today in the next room will be to breathe through this mask. The air will be a little stinky, but that's okay. It's supposed to be stinky, but it will not hurt. It will help you fall asleep. When you wake up, you'll be in what we call the recovery room. That room looks a lot like this room. It has like this room, there'll be a nurse next to you like in this room. You're um, your family will be there like they're in this room. And most people like that room because that's where you're gonna get to eat again. They have snacks like goldfish, chips, Gatorade, ginger ale, juice. Just prepare them what they're gonna see, what they're gonna hear, what they're gonna smell. They are gonna feel better about the whole process if they know what to expect. So another important part of preparation is helping kids understand what their role is. We've already talked about how kids can be stressed out because they don't know their role while they're in the hospital. It's like the first day of school, they don't know what they're supposed to do. So um, let kids know what their role is each step of the way. Here are some examples. So when you go back to pre-op, your job is to put on these hospital pajamas. Your job is to stand on the scale while I see how much you weigh. Your job is to stand up nice and tall and be very still while I see how tall you are. Your job is to stay as still as a statue while I measure your blood pressure. 
you know, you'll feel a tight squeeze. So these are all good examples. You can do that for anything that you need to do. This is your job. And continuing along with preparation, um, this is an example of how to use child-friendly language. So we want to present information in a child-friendly way. Here are a few examples. So when letting a child know, um, you can see, you know, it talks about when describing length, it's better to describe an incision instead of saying, you know, it's gonna be this big, you can say it's gonna be smaller than a penny or it's gonna be smaller than the length of a Barbie shoe, something that they're able to relate to. And the same thing goes for when describing time. So you can say, you know, um, your surgery is going to be, if they ask how long is their surgery, you can say it's about an hour, which is less time than it takes to watch a Disney movie, or instead of saying 60 minutes, or you can tell them, you know, if they're having something done, how long will this take, you know, it'll take the same time as a commercial break, or one episode of Mickey Mouse Clubhouse, or one verse of um, Old McDonald, just something that they'll understand, instead of units of time, which doesn't always make sense to them. Okay, so now we're going to talk about um, strategies for communicating with pediatric patients and their families. When you work with pediatric patients, you're not just treating one patient, you're treating a family. So I wanted to start off this communication section with a slide on the significance of play. Um, play is a form of communication for children. The middle quote states that um, through play activities, children can actively participate in the learning process, better understand the information being presented, and become familiar pending procedures. And Mr. Rogers said, you know, play is often talked about as if it were a relief from serious learning, but for, a, for children, play is serious learning. Play is really the work of children. So you can see in the picture there, there's an anesthesia mask, there's stickers on it, there's a scent. Um, this is not a craft project, but it's a way for kids to learn about the mask. They understand how it works, what will be expected of them, and it also gives them some sense of control because they're able to decorate it to make it more for them and they're able to pick out a smell that helps it so that they had some control over what it's going to smell like. Okay, so now we're just going to go over a few do and do nots, um, which most of you I'm sure already know. But um, the first one is introduce yourself and take a genuine interest in the child. Um, kids are pretty good about seeing through if you're not being sincere. Um, when possible, get on the child's level. I always think of going to the dentist's office and how uncomfortable it is to have everyone hovering over my head with a bright light and a mask and tools. People are more comfortable when you're on the same level as them. So when you're in to talk to a child, try and get on the same level as them, at least while you're explaining things to them. Um, then use developmentally appropriate language. What words do they use at home? You know, even something so simple as saying we're going to go to the OR can be really confusing for kiddos. So make sure to say the words and not the acronyms. Um, and then interpret and respect verbal and physical cues. We have lots of kids who come from different backgrounds. We have different kids who are, you know, maybe on the autism spectrum and just aren't comfortable with you making eye contact with them. So don't feel like, you know, if you're looking at a child and they are uncomfortable, don't feel like you have to make eye contact in order to get a response back from them. Just read the situation. And then share relevant details and information. Um, just from my own experience, when I was um, in uh, having surgery, um, before I kind of started working in the medical um, profession, then um, I had surgery and I got the call beforehand. And you know, the lady was like, don't wear any lotion, don't wear any makeup, blah, blah, blah. And I, you know, I stopped her and I was like, you know, I have really dry skin. Like if I don't put lotion on as soon as I wash it, it's going to start cracking. It's just a lot more comfortable if I wear lotion. So is it okay if I put on a little lotion? And instead of her simply saying, no, please don't do that, she went into, you know, well, we're going to be taping your eyes closed and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and I was terrified. I was really scared. And I was like, well, I just, that doesn't sound like something fun for me. So when I talk to a child and prepare a child. I'm not trying to sugarcoat things, but I want them to understand things that are relevant. So from the time they get there to when they fall asleep, from the time they wake up to when they leave. Okay, another thing to take into consideration is trying to use pronouns correctly. So kids are learning what it means when you say things like I, we, you, me, they, etc. So try and be clear and avoid, avoid saying we for everything. So don't be like, you know, we're going to go back to the next room. We're going to we're going to change into a gown. We're going to measure your blood pressure. We're going to we're going to we're going to um, instead be clear and say we are going to go back to the room. You are going to change into your gown. I am going to measure your blood pressure. Be clear about who's doing what. 
um, provide realistic choices. Um, only give choices when you're able to follow through with what they choose. We'll go over this in just a second. Um, you see encourage review of information and questions. Always ask them if they have questions. You know, I'm I'm talking at you. I can't see you right now, so I can't ask you questions and follow up. But if I was able to ask questions, I would know if you're understanding the things that we're going over. And then give effective praise. Identify what they did well. Um, an example of that is you could say, you know, you're doing a really great job holding your arm still instead of saying, hey, you're such a good boy, you know, let them know what they're doing well so that they can keep that up. Okay, so I mentioned multiple times that giving choices is a great a great thing. It helps kids feel more involved in their care and more in control of their experience. So here are a few tips on giving appropriate choices. Um, for example, you know, it's time to take your medicine. You get to choose, would you like to take your medicine out of a cup or a syringe? Um, or I'm going to put the sticker on your finger. Which finger would you like me to put it on? I'm going to put this tight squeeze on your arm. Which arm can I put it on? You know, give them choices when they're able to make choices. But like I said, not when it's a choice they can't make. Okay, so while we're talking about communicating, think about the language that you use with pediatric patients. Sometimes there are words that have different meanings that can be really confusing. For example, um, die, as in contrast, instead of die as in no longer living, they sound exactly the same. Um, you can always ask a child if they know the meaning of the words that doctors or nurses are using with them, or you can simply ask them if they have questions about any of the words that they've heard. Um, you can see here where it mentions being put to sleep. That is that that language can be really confusing for children, and then you see like on the right, you see that we're going to move you to the floor, and that picture is a child crawling on the floor. Um, they don't know what that means. You can say, you know, you're going to be going to a different part of the hospital. And so here are a few suggestions on words that you can use when explaining things to pediatric patients. Um, so for instance, when preparing for an IV poke, then I, I always use poke instead of like, this is going to be a stick, a sting, or a bee sting, a shot. Um, when explaining, you know, what to expect when they go to the operating room and they're getting anesthesia, I usually feel, tell them they're going to feel something warm instead of that it's going to burn. Um, when showing the, the tourniquet, you can explain it as a rubber band. When using the IV, I always show them the little plastic straw and say, you know, this is what it's going to look like. The needle comes right out and this part is bendable and it's, that's what it looks like. Um, and then, of course, the leads, they're going to know them more as stickers. So you can show them to them, show them how it's sticky, and, you know, you can call it a sticker. You're going to put three stickers on a chest. Um, and then one that I like to point out is at the bottom where it suggests to replace the word take with measure or check. Um, when we get kids back to the pre-op area who are very upset already when they come back, um, I'll always, or not always, but very frequently, hear staff want to help them feel better and more comfortable, and I'll hear them say, you know, it's okay, there's nothing to worry about in this room, we're just going to take your vitals. Um, but imagine you're a six-year-old, and of the words take and vitals, which one do you think most kids understand? They hear the word take, and they're not sure what you're taking, but they know you're taking something. So this is why I like to explain, like I said previously. So the, in this room, you're going to stand on the scales, you're going to have a tight squeeze on your arm. We're going to put a sticker on your finger. Just explain what to expect instead of take vitals. Um, and here are a few other examples on what you could say. You know, instead of saying this part is going to hurt or here's the bit, um, you can say it may feel like a poke. It may feel, you know, insert here. Um, instead of saying this medicine will burn, you can say some kids say it feels very warm. Um, you know, instead of saying this medicine tastes really bad, you can say it may taste different than things they've had before. And, you know, let me know what you think after you take it. Just be honest. I mean, honestly, I've never had Versed, but I can tell that it doesn't taste good because so far no one's liked it. Um, but I'm not going to tell them, you know, this is really gross medicine. Please take it. <laughs> okay, so just briefly, I wanted to talk about working with children needs. Um, if you interact with pediatric patients in the hospital, then there is a good chance that you have interacted with a child who has special needs. So a child who has special needs is any child who needs accommodations. That means cognitively or physically or emotionally. So currently, one in six children have developmental disabilities. One in 59 children are on the autism spectrum. Um, I attended a children's health workshop about autistic children in the hospital, and my favorite quote was the first bullet point where it said, 
If you have met one person with autism, you have met one person with autism. Autism is a spectrum disorder, so every child is different. So most children with autism cope better with structure, with consistent routines, and that makes the hospital an especially difficult place to be. Um, I also attended a different presentation that was given by a child life specialist and a nurse from Boston Children's, where they care for over 5,000 patients with autism spectrum a year. And on average of those 5,000 patients, they each come to the hospital seven times a year. So when they come to the hospital seven times a year, I'm not with them each time they come. You're not with them each time they come. The only person who's gonna be consistently with them is their caregiver. So communicating with their caregiver is the best thing that you can do. They will know if you have to put on a pulse ox, which is the best place to do it. Um, if you need to get their blood pressure, what's the best place to do it? How do you do it? They know what works best. They've seen it all. Please use them, use their knowledge. It will help you. They, are, they can help you. Um, when you work with children with special needs, please tell the child what you're doing and what and, and repeat it as you do it. Just because maybe they aren't responding the way you're used to doesn't mean that they're not listening. And going along with that, some of these patients are not able to vocalize the way that they're feeling. So the way they communicate is instead through their behavior. So a lot of times it can be mistaken that they have behavioral issues, but they're actually just letting you know, you know, they're doing this because they're scared. So maybe they're rocking back and forth, they're pacing, they're making noises, they're repeating phrases, um, they're flopping their arms. These are just reactions to say, you know, I'm feeling stressed. What is happening to me? What is this change in the routine? Um, so I encourage you, um, if you're, if you have patients with these, with, uh, on the spectrum or different um, developmental delays, I encourage you to think outside the box to help these patients and meet their needs. Um, we've had, we had one patient who was uh, super sensitive to smell and um, uh, an IV was out of the question. And so the anesthesiologist um, used the mask and held it on top of his nose so that it was covering his nose. He wasn't able to breathe through his nose, so he didn't smell it. So the only way the air was coming through was through his mouth. And so he didn't have to smell that bad smell. Um, and that, I mean, that was, um, a game changer for him. Another example that I have is um, a patient who came in, he'd come in multiple times. I'd had really struggled with finding a way to make it easier for him. And then I noticed that um, he really imitated everything that his dad did. And so instead of me um, trying to show him the mask, I gave him the anesthesia mask to the dad and had the dad um, imitate how to use it. So when we went back to the procedure room, his dad had a mask and he had a mask. Of course, his dad's wasn't hooked up to anything, but he knew his dad was doing it and he did what his dad did. So it, it worked amazing. Okay, so what can you do? Create a less stimulus stimulating environment when possible. You can, things like dimming the lights, lowering the volume, um, clustering care when possible is gonna help immensely. Less is more. The fewer people in the room, the fewer hands touching the child, or the fewer people staring at the child, the better. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've gone back to the operating room, the kid moves over to the operating room table, and then everyone's just standing there looking at him. I mean, I would be really uncomfortable with that as well. So keep that in mind when you go back to the operating room and try and step back and stay back until, it's until the child is asleep. And then prepare, prepare, prepare. Tell the child what you're going to do, repeat it as you do it. Um, some children really respond to verbal presentation preparation, others refer, prefer visual. And then good questions to ask, you know, is the child verbal, are they nonverbal? Are they comfortable with eye contact? How do they communicate their pain? Just ask the caregiver anything you need to know. Um, and then going along with this, don't, like I already mentioned, don't expect eye contact, but still communicate. Always ask the parent. Um, some children have trigger words that make them upset. So ask the family about this. Don't give choices that are non-negotiable. And when you do give choices to this population, limit the options to two, so they're not overwhelmed. Um, use proper concrete terminology. Don't use sarcasm or jokes. It doesn't, they don't understand that you're joking. Uh, eliminate extra bodies. Be aware of noise. Is there music playing? Um, if oftentimes we go into operating room, the staff already has music playing for this population. I would say actually for all children, keep the music off until they are asleep. It will help them feel more comfortable. And then use one voice until the child is induced. And I'm going to um, talk about that right now. 
So One Voice, the purpose of One Voice campaign is to remind healthcare professionals to be considerate of the clinical environment that kids are exposed to during medical procedures. So as we already um, stated, you guys are probably in the healthcare field because you want to help. So when you're around a child and the child's upset, most likely you want to contribute to helping them feel better. And um, the way that people do this is by you know, hey, it's okay, you're gonna do okay, you're fine, everything's fine, don't worry about it, you're doing great. Um, but the thing is, if many, many people are in the room and they're all contributing in that manner, then it just kind of contributes to the chaos in the room. So our the goal here is to have one voice heard during the procedure, and we hope that there's parental involvement and the parent is able to be that calming voice, but that's not always the case. Uh, maybe the parent is not with them, or maybe the parent is, um, not does also unsure of what to say and uncomfortable and doesn't know their role. So uh, make sure to educate the parent and let them know they can talk to their child while they're in there. Um, but if they're not talking, you know, uh, I, I don't know if anesthesiologists have special training in this, but I feel like they always have a soothing voice and start saying something. Um, whoever it is, try and keep it to a minimum of one person until the child falls asleep. And then just touching again on parental presence in the operating room. We have a parental presence policy at our hospital. The choice is ultimately up to the anesthesiologist. So even if the kids are given Versed before their procedure, they're gonna do better if a parent goes back with them for induction. Um, if a parent does go, make sure to prepare them for the experience. So educate the parent on what is normal behavior with anesthesia. You know, their, their child may get wiggly before they fall asleep. That, that's normal, it's the medicine. Their eyes may roll back, their breathing may sound different. That is because of anesthesia, they are safe. Um, many parents get really emotional when their child falls asleep in the OR, even though this is an emotional time for parents. I've had so many tell me how much they appreciated the opportunity to be with their child. So sometimes parents are just too anxious and parental anxiety can transfer the ch child and not all parents are suited to go back, but the ones who are able to go um, really can help and be a support to their child. Um, now, once in the operating room, pediatric patients do better if they have something to distract them. I mentioned earlier that they can be egocentric and see everything and just really worry about everything. So, and also mentioned earlier, at least in our facility, we have an iPad that has games downloaded for different age groups, and it's just a great tool to help create alternative focus. You can see a child using that here while he breathes through his mask. Um, we have kids play games until they fall asleep, and we just have someone hold it so it doesn't fall on them once they fall asleep. But if a child's focusing on a game, a joke, a book, a light spinner, then they're not paying as much attention to what's going on in the room around them. Um, oftentimes with their younger kids, a parent may be invited to sit in the chair and hold their child in a comfort position for induction. Older kids' parents stand right next to them by the bed. And like I said, just let them know they can hold hands, they can talk to them. They don't always know this unless you tell them. And then um, kids know they can take their, let them kids know that they can take comfort items with them to the operating rooms. You know, they're going to feel more comfortable if they're able to bring a blanket from home or bring their own stuffed animal, just helps them feel more normal. And then here are a few other forms of distraction um, for relaxation and to encourage deep breathing. You can always use pinwheels or bubbles um, for distraction and coping with the environment. Video games, iPads, toys, stickers, coloring books, light up toys. Oftentimes these kids bring these things on their own, so just let them know that use them while they're in pre-op or whatever. Um, and then other supportive things they could do, have a comfort item, like I just mentioned, stuff animal, blanket, pacifier, and then parental presence. And lastly, here are just 10 ways to cope with medical procedures. You see number one is crying. Oftentimes that makes us uncomfortable and we feel like we need to do something to make it stop, but sometimes that's just how they're coping with things. Um, they also may wanna squeeze things, a hand, a toy, a stuffed animal. Counting can be really helpful. Oftentimes we, counting and nobody does it anymore, but it can be really helpful while they're breathing through the mask if they're struggling to say, okay, we, we're going to do this for 60 seconds. Let's count um, and then count it out. Count really slow. <laughs> um, they can look, you know, people are, are voiders or sensitizers. They either want to look at what's going on or they don't want to look at it. So give them that option to look if it's going to help. Um, they can imagine a favorite place. They can relax by pretending they're on, you know, at their favorite place. They're on a playground, they're on a the beach, they're playing games. Sometimes the way that kids cope is by screaming um, or talking or breathe, taking deep breaths um, or using their words. Tell them, use their words. Tell me how, how you're feeling. Um, so these are all different ways that kids cope. 
So you can always shoot me an email if you have any questions about working with kids and our pediatric patients, especially for surgery. Um, this is my email and I'd love to answer any questions, but um, thank you for listening and good luck.